Hi class, I'm going to talk today about Chapter 2, Colonial Worlds 1607 to 1750. One of my favorite parts of this chapter was the section on material culture. Um, this is talking about the physical objects that we have left from the colonial era and what these objects tell us about the women who used them and how they were used. Um, I'm particularly interested in this because I'm a crafter. Uh, I am a knitter. I have a knitting project here. This is, it looks like a blob right now, but uh, maybe I'll finish it before the semester's out show you what it was supposed to be. Being a knitter has given me an appreciation for these material goods and the way that they're made. So when they talked about spinning, I wanted to elaborate on this a little bit. I'm going to show you the picture of the spinning wheel in the book. Um, in the text they ask you the importance of the size of the wheel, but there's really no way to tell how big this wheel is. Um, I don't know this particular style for sure, but spinning wheels could be as high as chest high, um, but I think this one is probably closer to about knee height. So you would sit in front of it, and there's a little pedal at the bottom that you would use. Uh, you'd pedal that with your foot, makes the wheel go round, and it tightens the fibers and spins them from a big fluff of some sort of fiber. Um, and they say cotton or linen, but wool would have been a lot more common. Um, from that fluff of fiber into some fantastic yarn, like this. Um, so I have a little bit of material culture show and tell of my own to show you. This right here is a drop spindle. This is how people spun before spinning wheels. Um, and this is something that you would dangle, the yarn is hooked on here, um, and I am not going to demonstrate, and I, but I will link um, to a demonstration of how drop spindling works. Um, this right here is the first yarn I ever spun myself and it's really thick and this is not very well done but this is where you start. Uh, a colonial woman would have spun much much finer because uh, you want something fine when you're weaving. Uh, with knitting you can go with thicker yarn but uh, you, you usually don't want to anyway. So in the text they talk about the different forms of women's labor, and they go, don't go into a lot of detail. Um, but aside from agricultural responsibilities and child rearing, she would usually also be responsible for laundry, which when you don't have running water or hot water or a washing machine is an enormous task. Um, she would be responsible for making the clothes in the first place, spinning the wool, weaving the wool, or linen or cotton. Um, uh, and sewing that wool cloth uh, or linen or cotton cloth into clothes for her family to wear. Once they have worn holes in those clothes, she gets to repair them. Um, she probably also would have knitted socks for her family. Um, and women were also responsible for food pre preparation which was also a lot more time consuming than it is now. Um, so these forms of work took up a, whole, a woman's whole day, and that's why we don't have a lot of women who had time to write poetry. Um, but um, one of the things they said that was so interesting to me was that since some women were good at specific tasks and other women were good at other tasks, they would trade. So since I'm good at knitting, but I'm not that great at sewing, um, I might trade socks for dresses um, or for a little bit of embroidery with a neighbor. And that brings us together, helps us develop a sense of community. Um, and I'm able to take advantage of my particular skill with knitting as compared to someone else's skill. Maybe I can get her to bake a pie. Um, so I just thought that was kind of a, a neat aspect of women's culture in this area, era. One thing I'd really like to caution you against is underestimating the value of the economic contribution of women in a household. Uh, in this era, women did a lot of work. 
and when women weren't present it made difficulties for men so I mean laundry is an example when you don't have any women around somebody has to figure out how to wash shirts and in 1650 um, washing a shirt was a lot more complicated than it is today um, and finding a new division of labor in a society where there weren't a lot of women was very hard on the English settlers who came here. Women's domestic work was very important to the survival of the colonies, and as the population of women increased in the colonies, uh, politically things became a lot more stable. Now, women had all of this domestic work to do, but we also have examples in the text of women who worked outside the home, um, women who were in business, and so on. We also need to keep in mind that most women in this era were responsible for the shopping. If there was shopping to be done, so you find this more in towns, etc., where women are, where the family isn't farming its own food that the women were in charge of the household economy, of making sure that they got a good price for all of the food they were purchasing and bringing into the home. Um, and this is a really vital area of commerce that um, we sometimes have a tendency to overlook, so I want you guys to keep that one in mind as well. So there are women in business, um, and we have these examples of really powerful women um, who become crucial to the economy of their states. Um, these women sometimes had to work around a system that viewed them as subordinate to their husbands, even on the same level as children. Um, other women practice their rights as widows or as single women to basically function independently from men. Um, and they are exceptions, but they're numerous enough that it's unfair to make a generalization that all women were only ever in the house and never got out of the house. Another really interesting part of this chapter deals with legal proceedings, and especially with um, the witch trials that went on in New England. In the case of the Salem witch trials, you have a group of young women who are accusing mostly older women, a lot of them are pillars in the community. And this is a really interesting dynamic here. What you have is a group of young women who have found a way that they can assert power. This is one of the few ways that young women had of exerting power in a Puritan community. Unfortunately, they turn it on other women, uh, several people wound up hanged, and the whole thing got out of control to the point where now, when things are getting out of control, uh, we call it a witch hunt. Um, good job, Salem. I was also really intrigued by the story of Judith Catchpole that appears in your textbook on page 97 and 98. So Judith Catchpole was a young indentured servant who came over and during her passage from England to the New, new World, she was accused of having a baby and killing her baby. This is a pretty serious accusation, um, so they assemble a panel of 11 women jurors to take a look at her and decide whether or not she had recently had a child. And these women look and they determine that she has not had a child and therefore she must be innocent. She hasn't had a child recently. Um, so I think that the textbook wants us to believe that this is evidence that women did have some legal status because these 11 women were asked to um, to be the, the jury in this woman's case um, rather than having men decide the question. But if you read a little further, the woman who accused Judith, I assume it's a woman, the woman who accused Judith Catchpole of having this baby and murdering it was insane and she was dead by the time the trial came around. So for Judith Catchpole, her whole life was put on hold because she was accused by a crazy person, and the community actually took it seriously, to the point where they really did 
get 11 women to go and look at this poor lady and decide whether or not she had recently had a baby. Um, I feel like the fact that it got to that point with a crazy person accusing her um, really speaks to the low status of this woman and how much they were willing to believe that she would do. Well, those are most of my thoughts on chapter two. I did enjoy this chapter. I hope you guys did too. If you have any particular questions for me, as always, you can shoot me an email or contact me on Angel. I look forward to reading your discussion on chapter two and hope to hear from you soon.